Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our praise and worship service. It's great to see you all here, and um, welcome to those watching on YouTube. Um, you will see me disappearing from sight as I whip round the back of the camera to, uh, to move it round so that uh, those watching online can follow the, uh, follow the, uh, the, the words upon the screen behind me. Please do read or otherwise inwardly digest the weekly notice sheet. There's lots of stuff going on for your um, amusement or for your interest. Um, please do think about taking some of these notice sheets home with you, um, or rather not home with you, but out into the community. There are those who may have been coming to work, uh, worship with us physically who can't get to us at the moment. Um, there may be other people who you think might be interested in what's going on and might still be sort of going, mm, I'm not entirely sure I want to go into church. Drop them a notice sheet off. Say Jill's been printing loads again, um, you might want one. Just to put in your recycling so that my recycling doesn't get too full. You never know, they, might, they may read it. Um, also, I'm asking if anybody could help me do the um, do the videoing of the service. What it really entails is pressing start, pressing record, then just swinging it round whenever um, it needs to be pointing at a different thing, and then pressing end. It's not all that complicated. Uh, the com complicated bit comes when it's um, putting it up online, and if that's not your thing, then that's fine. What would be really helpful is just somebody who can set it up, press play, a press record, and, uh, and then press stop again at the end of the service. So have a think, um, do have a chat with me, not after this service, because I've got to get off to St Wolfrids, but um, at some other time, give me a call, and I'll happily come and um, we can video your garden, shall we say, well, while you think about whether it's something you can do. But in the meantime, let us just propose our hearts and our minds to prayer. <coughs> Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So if you're able, you're welcome to stand and sing with us, come, such a rule and reign.
please be seated. Jesus Christ, our risen Master and triumphant Lord, as we come to you in sorrow for our sins, so let's just take a moment to reflect, to bring to mind all those things that we have said and done and thought, or not said and done and thought, that we wish to bring to God in prayer. We confess to you today our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God of heaven and earth forgive us and free us from our sins and bring us into that right relationship with him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, you know, that's the end of the blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that's what happens when you decide to go off piste and do something different and not actually read what's in front of you. So listen to us all, just read what's in front of you, Reverend Jill. <laughs> Speaking of what's in front of me, the next hymn. So why don't we stand to sing our next two songs, All Hail the Lamb and Father of Creation.
please be seated for our readings. <coughs> our first reading is the second reading on the sheet. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 to verse 4, and chapter 2, beginning at verse 5 to 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honour, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the creation. I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. This is the Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees came and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child would never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. 
So may the words of my mouth and the inspiration of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. They seem like a really odd collection of, uh, um, of readings, don't they? They're quite harsh. They're quite complicated. Certainly there's an awful lot of information in there that you could preach on, that you could spend days reflecting on and just dwelling in. But I wondered, what came to you as you heard them? Were you concentrating on the story of creation, of um, Jesus being the imprint and uh, of God's very being? Did you reflect instead on how we are all brothers and sisters because of what God and Jesus has done for us? Perhaps instead you were transfixed on the conversation around marriage and divorce and the idea of two becoming one flesh. Perhaps you uh, instead fixated on the idea of man and woman, he created them, and that led you to think about the Methodist and the Anglican conversations, indeed all the world religions' conversations about human sexuality. And perhaps like me, you wondered what on earth this little ditty was doing, sitting at the very end of Jesus welcoming a child into the midst of them. You've got some really weighty issues, some really interesting theological concepts to really get to grips with, to really spend time. If I were there, I would be expecting Jesus to spend time with his disciples really unpacking this, really exploring with them the issues of, of, of sexuality and, and, and so on in, in the day. But he doesn't. It's almost, dare I say, and apologies to anyone who has ever preached um, on marriage and divorce and, and all that kind of thing, but it's almost like he doesn't matter. Well, of course, marriage is set up to be this eternal relationship, but we lose the we lose the sense of the words when we focus on just one relationship. In welcoming the little child into the midst of um, the disciples, Jesus was reminding us that his teaching relates to every single human relationship we have. And that it's not about male and female and marriage and not marriage and civil partnerships and all the rest of it. It's about how we treat one another. Let's look back again for a moment at Hebrews. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. This is God we're talking about. What does God care about human beings as opposed to any of his other creation? If we were to have heard from Genesis, we'd have heard the creation story of God creating every single living being on earth, looking for the right partner for Adam. But, says, um, says the writer to the Hebrews, you have crowned them with glory and honour, subjecting all things under their feet. God decided that human beings would become his partner in creation. Not in creating, but in looking after his creation. And that Adam and Eve would be the ones to name and to control and to manage and to tender and care for all that God had put, given to them to look after. And despite us messing it up, Jesus comes to us as our brother, 
is sanctified by God to be that person to save us from our sins, to once again remind us of our obligations to each other and to God, and to say, come back into a right relationship with me. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. That's what we're here for, to praise God and to be in relationship with each other. So the Pharisees have sort of got it right in asking Jesus what should happen. In this day and age, at this point in the human history, as the Pharisees and Jesus are talking, it is incredibly easy for a man to divorce his wife. All he has to do is say, I divorce you three times and she's gone. And a divorced woman in that society is an unclean woman, an outcast. He is, in effect, condemning her to a life of, at best, staying at home with her, her own family, her paternal, maternal family, at worst, condemning her to a lifetime on the streets. She certainly would not be marital, um, marital status unless somebody wanted to um, disobey all the laws of, of the Pharisees and Sadducees of the time. So Jesus is speaking into a, a time and a situation where women are being treated as disposable, where men are not thinking through the implications of the commitment that they make. And he's saying to people, think about the relationships you have for each other. This is how it was meant to be, that you were meant to be helpers and supporters, encouragers and fellow rulers of this earth together. Not treating one or other as disposable. Not treating one or other as something just to be discarded, something to be maltreated. In fact, when you see a little child coming, running around towards me and you discard them and, and send them away, you are treating them as disposable. Instead, says Jesus, <coughs> welcome the little child, be like the little child. Now, I don't know about you, but I've met, met a few little children and I'm not entirely sure I'd like to be like them. Really, really and truly. But if we take some of the good things we learn from children, perhaps we can see what Jesus is getting at. That sense, when you see them playing in the nursery, so right when they're very little, and they're playing with each other, and yes, there's some squabbles over Lego bricks, and there's some, um, some fighting or some crying as they, as they figure out they can't do exactly what they want, when they want to do it. But equally, there's some amazing moments where they stop what they're doing and huddle around the child that is looking lost. Where they reach out to the stranger who's come for the first time, adult or um, child, and make them welcome. You see, children have yet to learn the social dynamics of mistrust. Hopefully, the children have not yet learned the, the dynamics of mistrust. In the best of situations, children are ready to welcome, ready to love, ready to trust, ready to share their affection, ready to share their lives, if not their toys with the ones in their midst. And that ideal, I know no child is ideal all the time, but that ideal is what Jesus is reminding us that we should all be. That we were all created equal. That God himself um, enabled human beings to rise above the rest of created order 
but didn't create one of us better than the other. But that we would become one flesh with each other, brothers and sisters, husband and wife, in relationship with each other. That we would share <coughs> all things and believe and trust and enable and encourage. Very truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. This day I pray that you will put aside human ideas of relationships and instead focus on the idyllic youth, the idyllic childhood that we wish all our children would, would undergo and be ready to receive as a little child and be ready to give as that child also. Amen. As we reflect on what we've heard, we stand to sing Light in My Darkness.
please be seated for our friends. and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. O oh God, the creator and preserver of all, we pray for people in every kind of need. Make your saving ways known on earth, your help among all nations, particularly in Afghanistan. We pray for this good estate of the Catholic Church, Guide and govern us by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. We commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body or spirit. Comfort and relieve them in their need. Give them patience in their sufferings and bring good out of all their afflictions. In particular, we pray for Reverend Stephen and his wife Ruth, John Jordan and June Cooper. We remember those who have gone before us in the peace of Christ. And we give you thanks for all your faithful ones with whom we rejoice in the communion of saints in particular the family and friends of Albert Castle, Brian Jackson, and Helena Chapman. All this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we stand again to sing our next song, Amazing Grace. <clears throat>
And so the peace of God, which passes all understanding, <coughs> keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. And so we sing our final song, In Christ Alone.
So go in peace to love and serve the Lord.